Hi everyone, Christy here from Master One Thing. Today we have the honor to have Professor Brian Kennedy from the National University of Singapore as our guest in the podcast. Brian is one of the world's leading longevity researchers who has done longevity research for more than two decades. He is uh, active in uh, many different uh, longevity companies and uh, has been uh, the president and CEO at the Buck Institute for Research on Aging. Throughout the years, uh, he has uh, done uh, many different uh, important longevity discoveries and uh, he is also one important uh, person who is uh, trying to move the longevity field uh, forward in a much uh, faster and efficient uh, way. This uh, work he's uh, currently doing in uh, Singapore and uh, there he's uh, leading a huge uh, longevity research uh, project which we are going to talk about in this uh, podcast. But we are also going to talk about uh, rapamycin, mTOR, and uh, other interesting longevity topics. So, Brian, welcome to the show. Thanks. It's good. Thanks for inviting me. It sounds like fun. Yeah, great. One uh, good place to start this uh, interview is to go back uh, to the early days uh, of your uh, longevity journey on how it was uh, started. Uh, why did you decide to focus on longevity research? I, I think that, you know, looking backwards, there was probably two motivating factors. One was the fact that I was an only child in my whole family. And uh, Everyone lived forever. Both of my grandmothers ended up living to 100. My great-grandmother was 94, I think. Uh, my mother's 85 now, taking no medicines, basically. And uh, um, people just, you know, I was around a lot of older people growing up and not many children. So I was fascinated by how some people age in a healthy way. Some people are unhealthy. Some people are happy. Some people are depressed. And uh uh, I didn't know what made things go so differently in, in different people. And then on top of that, when I got to do my PhD at MIT, you know, I started talking to Lenny Garente, who was a professor there. And at the time, you know, he was uh, working on transcription, but he was looking for something else to do. Uh, and there was another grad student, Nick Ostriaco, uh, and I, and we were we wanted to work in yeast cells in his lab and because uh, we loved working in yeast. It's very fast and fun experimental organism. And we thought, you know, what's the craziest thing we could do in a yeast cell? Uh, and given that it's a single celled organism, you know, aging seemed pretty crazy. So uh, uh, we started thinking about it and realized that there might be a project there. And Lenny was very open to that. The rest is history. Lenny, you know, published a lot of great papers in the longevity field. I've published a few too, and Nick became a priest. So go figure. <laughs> so. Uh, well, what what was uh, one of the discoveries you did uh, in the beginning uh, on the yeast research? I think the probably uh, one of the most important things I can say about that research is Nick and I were extremely dedicated and driven to succeed and we worked hard uh, but on, at the same time there was serendipity that played a big role in the process too and, and I suspect that every big discovery uh, there is some level of serendipity underlying it you know as professors we tend to want to come across as intellectual so we when we tell the story after the fact we're you know, I, I, we, we knew A, and then I used my big brain and thought B must be true, and we tested that, and look, it's true, and that means C has to be true, and that, and I don't think science ever goes that way. <laughs> you know, I think that a lot of times what happens is you get an observation that you don't understand and doesn't make sense, and you choose to follow it up, and you know, any observation like that is a huge opportunity. You're the only person in the world that has that knowledge. 
And sometimes those observations lead to, to big results. And so in the case of the yeast, what we found is that in the strain we were working in, there was a correlation between the amount of time that the yeast cells could live when we put them in the cold in the refrigerator, basically, and the lifespan of those yeast cells. And um, then we realized that we could, there was a stress resistance that the long lived yeast had. And we could take advantage of that to take stress sensitive cells and mutagenize them and make them stress resistant uh, and then test their lifespan. And that's how we got mutants that were long lived in yeast. And the mutants we found were in this complex of proteins called the SIR complex, uh, which contains SIR2. Uh, although the mutants we found were not directly in SIR2, they, what they did is they redirected SIR2 activity to other parts of the nucleus. Uh, and that's what was important for aging. And, you know, SIR2 is a protein deacetylase, uh, and sir one is the human ortholog. So, you know, when I started in yeast, I, I wasn't trying to understand human aging by studying yeast cells necessarily, um, but we really didn't understand yeast in any system. And so I, I think what we felt is that this is a simple enough system, we might actually understand why things age and even if the pathways are not directly transferable to humans, that's okay. It's still worth having that knowledge because it helps us think about aging. But in retrospect, you know, the, we found the sirtuin pathway in yeast, we found the TOR pathway in yeast, you know, and a bunch of others, ribosomes, that are linked to aging in humans as well. Uh, and uh, it's remarkable how much conservation there is about the things that control the aging in different species. And uh, as you said, you, you did an uh, important uh, discovery also uh, on the TOR uh, pathway. Can you explain what the uh, uh, TOR or uh, mTOR is? Yeah, so mTOR is a kinase that um, in the cell, so it, it regulates other proteins by phosphorylating them. Uh, and it's right at the nexus of nutrient signaling. Uh, so we knew that uh, things like calorie restriction extend lifespan in a wide range of organisms, including mammals. And at the time, we really didn't know why. And so people were looking at that. Uh, and TOR seemed like a really good candidate for that because it responds to amino acid levels. It responds to carbohydrate levels in, in mammals. That goes through insulin IGF signaling. Uh, and... Um, you know, when nutrients are high, mTOR is active and it signals the cells to grow and divide. And when it, nutrients are low, mTOR is in, unphosphorylated and then the cells um, stop growing and dividing and turn on stress resistance pathways. Uh, and so we thought, you know, we got mTOR then yeast out of a screen for long-lived mutants. Uh, and we thought it probably might underlie this calorie restriction process other people had more or less contemporaneously reported that in flies and, and, and yeast as well, uh, that reduced TOR signaling extend lifespan. And the, the end result of this is that uh, this is probably the most conserved pathway, at least to our knowledge, in longevity at this point. Turning down mTOR is very robustly extends lifespan in mice. And it probably overlaps with what calorie restriction is doing, but it's not identical. Calorie restriction regulates other pathways, uh, but mTOR is a very robust target for extending lifespan and health span. Has your view on uh, mTOR uh, changed uh, throughout the years? Uh, yeah. um, no, I, I, I think we, I don't think I've, Think a whole lot differently about mTOR. I, I would say that we've. I guess what, I guess what I would say is we've learned a lot of things about mTOR signaling and aging. Although there's still some fundamental questions that are important. I think one of the problems with mTOR is it's at the nexus of everything, and so downstream of TOR is autophagy and mitochondria and cell growth and proliferation, ribosome regulation, uh, and all of those things have been linked to aging. So when you turn down mTOR. Are you getting the benefit because you're regulating all of those things or is one of those processes primary like autophagy? I still think that's an open question. And so there's a lot of research that needs to be done. I think, I guess what I've learned the most though is that at least in, in mice, you know, I don't think that what's happening is that we're turning down mTOR completely. I think that would be bad 
So mTOR needs to be activated when you have a meal or, or when you exercise or when you have a wound. In, in particular tissues, you need to turn on the mTOR pathway when you get an infection. Uh, the problem is with aging, what's happening is the baseline levels of mTOR are creeping up. And so it's not that you can't turn mTOR on. The problem is you can't turn mTOR off. Uh, and having constitutive mTOR signaling, especially in stem cells, I think is a really bad thing because it depletes the stem cell populations. Uh, and that's bad for aging. So what we think rapamycin and other mTOR inhibitors are doing is that they're restoring that dynamic range. You can still get mTOR activation when you need it, but you don't have that high basal level of mTOR all the time. Uh, and uh, I think that that leads to the question of why base, basal levels of mTOR are going up with age. And, and I think that inflammation is probably one of the, the signals to that, but we really don't understand that process completely right now. So, you know, a lot of work on mTOR, 20,000 papers, and, and we still have key fundamental questions that haven't been answered yet. So. Do you know if there is uh, some researcher or a lab who is uh, looking at uh, why mTOR is uh, increasing when we get older? Yeah, I, 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 several people have made those observations. Um, it's actually not a question we're asking directly at the moment in our lab. Uh, Sheen Tsai, who's another professor here at NUS in the Department of Physiology, has been looking at that a little bit in skeletal muscle and also trying to work downstream to see whether which target of mTOR is important for aging for ABP or S6 kinase um, or others. And uh, so she's doing a little bit on that. Uh, Dudley Lamming has done a lot of work on mTOR signaling and it's still looking at questions like that. But I don't, it's not, there may be people trying to answer that question. Yeah, yeah. Currently, you are in uh, Singapore, and uh, there are lots of uh, exciting uh, things happening there in the longevity field. Uh, what is the big uh, problem that uh, Singapore is uh, facing, and uh, what is the project that you are leading uh, which will help uh, Singapore probably solve this uh, issue? Yeah, I mean, I think the the problem is. The problems are the same as happening at different rates anywhere in the world. You know, you have very long life expectancy, lifespans going up faster than health span, which means people are sick longer. You have uh, extremely low birth rate, like a, a lot of other Asian countries have this challenge too. Uh, and in Singapore, you have the added challenge of it's a small island. It's not like we can put lots and lots of immigrants on to solve the demographic problems. Immigrants are typically young and balance the demography, but that's harder to, to do in Singapore. So the question is, you know, how do we keep a healthy, working, functional population uh, that can support economic growth? And also, how do we keep people healthy and happy as long as possible? I think we forget that sometimes. Uh, and to me, we're not going to achieve that goal by managing frail people you know once they're frail we certainly want to take care of them of course but i don't think that's solving the economic problem and it's also not the best quality of life for them uh, also aging is you know a risk factor for every disease but that doesn't mean we can solve aging by just treating diseases one at a time uh, we have to deal with the underlying problem, which is aging. And if we do that, we'll prevent many diseases simultaneously. Uh, and so I think there's a demand to increase health span in Singapore. And the government's really trying to do that multiple ways. They're, they're trying to get people to exercise more. They're, you know, thinking about diet uh, and the standard things that a lot of other people are thinking about. Um, but, you know, they've also, the university at least, has also brought us here, uh, not just me, but Andrea Meyer, who's my collaborator, uh, and we're really trying to create a full pipeline of research on healthy longevity, uh, the goal being to better better understand aging, develop in new interventional strategies, test them preclinically, and especially preclinically right now, we're interested in how do we combine different interventions together to get bigger effects? And we can talk about that if you want. And also how can we uh, personalize interventions so that we figure out what the right 
treatment is for each mouse, uh, for instance, and ultimately human, of course. Uh, and then at the human level, we're doing clinical testing now to try to determine whether interventions uh, extend health span. Uh, and that's beginning to translate to clinics that um, both private sector and ultimately at, at, here in the US that can uh, start to work with people to optimize their health span. Uh, so uh, I think that a lot of people are doing these kinds of things. What we're trying to achieve is I don't know if it's unique, but it's close to unique, which is to create that whole set of things together and have them integrated. So when we do a mouse aging experiment, we do it in a way that's most optimized to predict human outcomes, uh, for instance. And, and so I, I think there's value to trying to achieve that. We have a relatively large program trying to tackle this problem now. And you know, I'm hoping we can you know, extend the health span of Singaporeans. And that is uh, one uh, very interesting thing with your project because Singapore doesn't have the luxury of waiting, for example, a hundred uh, years before the research uh, comes. And, and then you need to find an uh, efficient way of delivering results. Can you talk a little bit? Uh, yeah, and, and I don't have that luxury either, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, how you solve uh, that issue uh, with uh, when we don't have the luxury of uh, waiting yeah. for the result? Yeah, so I think that that's why it's so critical to test interventions now. I, I don't think the interventions that we can test in humans, which are mostly supplements and maybe repurposing drugs at the moment, um, are likely to have the biggest effects in the long term. And I don't even know for sure that they're going to affect maximum human lifespan, but I do think they have a really good chance of extending health span. So maybe they'll square the curve, if you know what I mean, on the survival. Um, and if we can extend health span by just five years, it saves trillions of dollars globally and you know tens of billions of dollars in Singapore. And not only that, you know, and think of it this way: How much is it worth to you to have five extra years of health? You know, not five extra years of life tacked onto the end when you're hooked up to machines, but five extra years when you're still healthy, can still live your life and enjoy yourself. And I, I think that this is a revolution if, if we can achieve it. Um, and a lot of people in the longevity field have adopted that goal because if it, it can be achieved, what it says is that something that I think we already believe, but a lot of the world doesn't yet, which is that aging is modifiable. Uh, and that if we do the right things, and that could be lifestyle, could be supplements or drugs or other things down the road, we might have a dramatic effect, effect on how long we can live and how healthy we are doing it. So we're also looking at experiments to try to address sort of the bigger questions. What causes aging? Can aging be, it, can it not just be slowed, but can it be stopped? Can it be reversed? We're trying to think about that as well. But um a lot of our efforts right now are just to validate the things we have now, because I think the impact of that will be dramatic. Mm -hmm. so what tools are you using to validate the different uh, interventions? So the TAME trial is one something that's gotten a lot of popularity or press, at least. Uh, this is a study of metformin, and the idea is to prevent multiple different kinds of chronic diseases in late middle-aged people. Um, I don't have a problem with that trial. The problem, the, the issue though, is that the prevention trials are extremely expensive and they have to be highly, a lot of people to get the power you need to see outcomes. So, you know, it's a $60 million study that's hard to fund. I hope it gets done, by the way, I'm, I'm supportive of it, but I don't think that's a solution to, to achieve the goal, a lot of the goals we need to achieve. One of which is to compare lots of different kinds of interventions. I don't think anybody knows what's going to work best in humans. I, I wouldn't put my money on metformin, but I can see why people do. You know, I, I would put my money on rapamycin or other things. And so that's just my opinion. I don't know who's right. And, and we're not going to find out unless we can test 10 different things. And we can't do that with three-year, you know, 3,000 people studies, at least, at least not with the resources we have now. So uh, we're looking more at, biomarkers of aging and those could be clocks and we can talk about clocks 
uh, but they could also be physiologic parameters like pulse wave velocity or DEXA or or measurements like grip strength or muscle muscle mass, VO2 uh, max, you know. So we're looking at a wide range of different parameters, inflammatory markers also, uh, to try to see what aspects of aging can be slowed or reversed by interventions. Yeah. yeah. Because uh, that is one uh, big uh, challenge that the uh, longevity field has to find the uh, validation things because without them we cannot know if something works or not especially yeah. on a short-term basis because we cannot wait uh, for example 100 years before checking uh, intervention if it works or not so. i completely agree and i think that's why you know people talk about interventions mostly but that's why these biomarkers that have been developed over the last 10 years are just as important as the interventions um None of them are fully validated. I, I don't think any of us can answer all the questions on those either. Uh, nonetheless, you know, I think that methylation clocks and, and, and really not even specific to methylation. Uh, we're doing proteomic clocks and lipid clocks and other people have made microbiome clocks. And you know, Alex Zharankov has made a bunch of different kinds of clocks. Uh, you know, you can estimate biologic age from these clocks now. And then you can use them for endpoints to see if your intervention works or not. Uh, I don't know. The, the, here's questions we can't answer right now. The clocks are partially aligned with each other, but not completely. So they're probably weighted toward different elements of aging and somewhat differentially. I think they all or many of them tell us something about aging, uh, but I'm not sure any of them tell us everything about aging. Uh, you know, I, I, we don't know yet the what we get out of the clocks, why that tells us about aging either. So we you get, you know, 100 methylation sites. It's really hard to work from that to function. What we'd really like to know is this is, it's telling us about aging because these methylation sites are linked to autophagy and these are linked to something else. And, you know, th I'm just speculating that that data is more or less not known yet. And that's why we're working with lipid and proteomic clocks more because, lipids and proteins are active molecules and so you know what what you can do and you know we're my my person in my lab tells me we're doing meaningful ai which as it sounds like an oxymoron to me but we're trying <laughs> so you know what you can do is you can get you know 100 lipids that predict aging in the brain we have a study doing that with post-mortem samples okay uh, but then you can start to ask the question if we narrow that down how much of that uh, predictability of the clock can we retain with as few lipids as possible you know and in that case we can find five lipids that account for more than 90 percent of the, the the clock and those lipids are all one class of molecules and they've been linked to aging before and so it's good because we took a completely unbiased approach um, using ai and converge back on something that was speculated to be important in aging before. Uh, and now we, we can really dig into those molecules and not just say, all right, we got a new clock, but more importantly, we have a set of molecules that's really telling us the pace of aging. Uh, what are they doing? Why? Why is that important for aging? So I think it's partly about connecting the dots, connecting the interventions to the biomarkers, connecting the biomarkers to the aging hallmarks and pillars, you know, and and connecting all of that to different disease outcomes, that's sort of, you know, it's kind of a four-dimensional problem, but I think that's sort of what's starting to happen in the field is these different areas, you know, studies of age-related diseases, studies of hallmarks, biomarkers, and interventions, to a large extent, they're not that related to each other. You know, the biomarkers came from big data set and omics. You know, the, the interventions came from animal models. You know, the aging related diseases came from medicine you know as much as anything in, uh, in research and other areas of of biology so if we can connect them it really tells us we're understanding the whole picture and i think that's a critical next step if we look at the um, hallmarks of aging you talked a little bit about uh, that can you explain uh, to the listeners uh, what that is yeah, so um, in 2013, I think, 
uh, Carlos Lopez Oten and uh, some of his uh, colleagues um, uh, wrote a paper on the nine hallmarks of aging. I'm starting to lose track because there's so many different papers now. Uh, and the, the shortly after that, uh, with a bunch of colleagues from working uh, with me, we wrote uh, seven pillars of aging. Uh, and I think that there's been good and bad outcomes from these papers. Uh, the good outcome is it really galvanized the field and got everybody thinking, you know, not everybody agreed, but it sort of provided a framework for everybody to think about aging. Uh, and it led, that's one of the things that ultimately drove the investment in the private sector, because now, you know, there were conceptual targets to go after if you wanted to target the aging process. And uh, I think that's one of the things that stimulated so much investment in companies, which is great. On the other hand, I think that people, it led some people to think, oh, now, all right, there's seven or nine things. I guess there's a new new paper on Hallmarks of 12 now that if we just fix those 12 things, we're just going to live forever. And uh, I don't think that's what the data is telling us. I, um, I, the question of whether we can live forever is a different discussion. But I think what this data is telling us is that the interventions that extend lifespan in animal models and to the knowledge to the extent we know in humans, you can read them out as an improvement of all the hallmarks and pillars because they're not fixing one hallmark or pillar. What they're doing is these things are all connected to each other. You have a systems related network in your body that tries to keep you healthy. Um, it's not trying to make you immortal probably, it's probably trying to keep you healthy for evolutionary fitness, but it's it's there. It's it's responding to the things that happen to you and trying to keep you healthy. Uh, and I think the interventions hit nodes in that network. They they fortify the network. They don't fix the the endpoints of the network or the individual parameters. And so, mTOR signaling affects most or all of the hallmarks and pillars and sirtuins maybe and and others too. So, uh, and in fact, when you what really is happening is that these hallmarks and pillars are entrained to each other. Uh, once once you get into aging, they're all moving together. It's not like three of them are going bad and four of them are perfect. You know, so um, what we're really seeing is a connected network, and it's a good to think about these hallmarks and pillars because they give us specific molecular pathways to to rationalize in the context of aging, but they're not operating in isolation. If we look at uh, one thing that you talked a little bit uh, earlier about uh, was that uh, aging is uh, one of the biggest uh, risk factors. How does that uh, connect uh, to the hallmarks of aging? The way I see it is that coming back to this network concept that it, it's really a it's really it's sort of like a process of equilibrium. You know, you you have damage happening to your body. There's stochastic events happening to your body. There's you know, and, and they're different for different people, but they're, you know, they're overlapping, but different kinds of things are happening based on genetics and environment. And your body is responding to those things and compensating. And uh, all of the intra-organ signaling, part of that is to keep things functioning together and the response in response to change. Uh, eventually, however, the net, there's too many insults and the network breaks down. Uh, and when it breaks down, I think, you know, I, I think Felipe Sierra used this analogy first, and I like it. It's like, imagine you have a bunch of little mountains in a bathtub of different sizes, uh, but then you have water in the bathtub. As long as the water is covering the mountains, you don't see the mountains, right? But you know, the water starts going down, which is the loss of this homeostasis. Then you start to see mountain peaks coming out. And for different people, they may be different things. One person may have genetic risk of cardiovascular disease, so they show up with, with you know, with signs of cardiovascular disease. Somebody else might get diabetes or, or, or neurologic problems, and it, and and those individual risks are dependent on the person. But as long as the water is high, you know, it doesn't really matter. And so I think that it's that keeping the water high that we're trying to do in terms of healthy longevity. Yeah, that's a very interesting uh, metaphor there, that uh, the goal of the longevity interventions is to keep the 
water on a high level or slow it so that it doesn't go yeah. down as fast as it normally does. Yeah. yeah, I think I think you know that that is that's one way to think about it, at least in my mind. Mm. If we look at the different longevity intervention, they go to different nodes in the hallmarks uh, of aging and uh, some people think uh, like okay if i combine uh, for example the rapamycin and other different things uh, and cover uh, all the different uh, hallmarks of aging then i must uh, get the best uh, effect uh, for longevity what's your view on that uh, I, I, I'm going to use another. I mean, this is my analogy day, so I'm just going to use analogies all yeah. day. So I, I think that if you want to paint your wall and you pick one color of paint, you know, it can be beautiful. If you mix two colors together, you can get a third color that's really interesting. If you mix 20 colors together, you get kind of a gray brown thing that nobody wants on their wall. And I think that. I, I think that right now, that's my biggest concern is that because we've done some combinations in mice and uh, they don't always act additively and synergistically. I mean, that's what we're looking for when we do these studies. And I think the most common outcome is they don't really interact with each other much at all. So you get the more or less the uh, effect of the, the one that has the biggest effect on its own. Um, second most likely outcome we see is they cancel each other out. Uh, and then eventually we, sometimes we find things that are added. Uh, so if you're doing that, you know, that's in a mouse. So maybe it's different in humans. I don't know. But if you're doing that in a human right now, you're taking guesses just like us. And so I, 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 I look, I want to empower people. You know, I think that people are educated and, you know, as long as we don't recommend things that are fundamentally unsafe, uh, then if they want to be on the cutting edge and try things, then I, you know, I, I'm supportive of that. I think one of the problems with medicine is that, um, you know, doctors mean well, and they're certainly the most knowledgeable, but the decision-making has really gone totally in the hands of the doctors. And we're, we're not doing enough work to educate the population about the, how their body stays healthy, how it ages, what happens when they get sick. And if they're invested in that and they know that, then they can participate in the decision-making process and they will also be more active about complying with whatever they're doing. So if they, and I think that we we're missing that educational component. I think that's a big element of healthy longevity is people have to be empowered to make decisions. And then we have to give them some freedom to do that, you know, and uh, right now that, that's not happening very much. Um, however, you know, I, I'm nervous about people that are taking 10 different things. I'll be honest with you. I, I don't know what that's doing. And think about it this way. You know, most of the interventions that we test, one way or another, they regulate mTOR. And so if you have a low level of rapamycin, then, you know, you can restore that balance between unactivated and activated mTOR maybe with aging. If you start hitting mTOR from three different paths, three different angles, maybe you're turning down activated mTOR at that point, and that's causing a different problem. So um, that's just an example, but you know, we don't really know the primary pathways that these different interventions are hitting. And so, if you hit the same thing from too many different ways, you're going to go from good to bad. And and, and and I think that that's a concern right now. So you know, it's it's. You know, if Brian Johnson could do what he wants, uh, you know, I, I I think he's entitled to that, but it, it wouldn't be my approach. So. You mentioned uh, that you have uh, done some research on uh, my studies where combination has been done. Um, what uh, specific combination uh, have you seen that are detrimental or, or cancel each other out? Well, first of all, in our hands, we see very little efficacy from NAD precursors. There's something there, but it's very weak. Um, and I don't know why. I, I, I'm not, I don't want to get in a fight and say they don't work because, you know, there's also data suggesting they do work in different contexts. So, uh, but in our hands, they're pretty weak. And I, I, I think that either may be because the bioavailability of these things is very low, so you're not having a big impact on NAD, 
or it could be because we're overvaluing the role of NAD in aging, I, I, or it could be because we're doing something different from what other people are doing experimentally in the lab. And we know that, especially in mouse experiments, um, you know, changing things like the, you can keep the diet composition, but change the source of it and you can get different outcomes. So I, I think that um, I can't tell you what's going on. What we do know is that like when we add something like NMN, it, it uh, cancels out the effect of AKG. Uh, and so um, there are interactions between these different small molecules. And um, I think it's critical to test them in combinations uh, in, and not in a screening nece way necessarily. I mean, that's fine, but that's screening approaches are with a lot of different combinations are too underpowered. We need to do the, the key combinations with enough power to see whether they're working or not. So that's what we're one of the things we're trying to do. You mentioned the alpha ketoglutarate. Uh, can you talk uh, about uh, what that is and the history behind it? it so this is another metabolite. It's in the TCA cycle. So it's really at the interface between carbohydrate, uh, uh, catabolism, uh, protein, catabolic uh, catabolism or anabolic activity and respiration or energy production. So, um, and it goes down with aging much like NAD. Uh, and uh, so what we found is that supplementing it back up uh, is, really good for health span and has a small but positive impact on longevity as well in animal models. We also have some human data with a product that contains sustained release AKG and also uh, vitamin A if you're male and vitamin D if you're female. Uh, and that product, it, at least by some methylation tests, reverses biologic age by a few years, up to, up to seven years actually, if people take it. Um, there's several things to unpack with that statement. We chose vitamin A and vitamin D because we saw additive effects in the animal models so that those combinations appear to be useful. Um, we haven't published any data yet with placebo controlled studies with this product, Rejuven. Uh, and so the effect we're seeing, you know, I, I tend to believe that if you're paying $100 a month to be younger, you're younger. <laughs> And the reason I say that is because I think there's a big placebo effect on longevity and attitude mindset um, probably has an impact. And if you stumble upon a product that, that like a supplement like that, you may dig into a lot of other information on longevity and, and change your lifestyle too. So, you know, there's a lot of components going on there, but I think that at least I believe that the, the, the supplement is actually having some of the effect as well. And so, uh, we're trying to test that in clinical studies right now. Um, AKG is involved in about 600 different enzymatic reactions in the cell. So the, we're also struggling to try to figure out which ones of those are important for the aging process. Uh, and we have a, um, some, we've shown a few different things which we haven't published yet because we're still trying to find the real smoking gun, but it improves uh, red, blood, red blood cell function. Um, and, uh, you know, AKG is a substrate for TET enzymes, which are involved in DNA methylation. And so it may be that it's directly affecting, you know, epigenetic changes with aging. And then finally, we seem to think, uh, we we more, we actually think that, that it's uh, uh, increasing the mucosal layer in the colon and improving gut barrier function. So we're looking at the microbiome related effects of AKG as well. But just like with NAD, I mean, people tend to equate NAD with sirtuins, but as much as I would like to say sirtuins are the key factor, NAD is involved in hundreds of different reactions too. And uh, these molecules are highly utilized in different tissues for different things and trying to figure out what they're, what the benefit of them is, is a challenge. Who do you think will get the best effect of uh, taking AKG? Yeah, so uh, what we see so far in the human studies is that if you look at the baseline biologic age of individuals when they start the study, um, you know, the, it maybe it ranges between five and 10 years in either direction from their chronologic age. Uh, and the people that are already aging extremely well 
biologically have very little small response to AKG. The people that are biologically older have a much bigger response. So, you know, in that case, you know, it's helping people that are not already aging extremely well. Uh, now, a big question I have, is that going to be something we see with a wide range of different interventions? Or is it a common feature of longevity interventions? Or is it a unique to AKG and we'll see something else with exercise or rapamycin or whatever? I, I, I don't know what the answer to that is. Uh, and uh, that's why I think we need so many more of these interventional studies to try to begin to see what the patterns are. Uh, we have to get more human data. And it's good because it, I think it's happening now, not just in our group, but other people are doing these kinds of things too. Are you taking uh, AKG? Yeah, I take the rejuvenate product. I, you know, it's AKG is, it, there's one thing that's pretty clear in the literature, it's extremely safe. Um, and uh, uh, I've taken it for a while. Uh, I, I feel like it helps me, but that's a very anecdotal statement that, yeah, then again, I would, right? So, uh, um, and uh, I try to do some endurance and exercise resistance training. Um, and uh, uh, I'm not good at it, but I try to eat relatively healthy. Uh, I think that I've also tried other things. Uh, I, I'm currently trying Fucoidin, which is a super a pr proposed to be a CERT-T6 activator, another natural product. I mean, the barrier I have is that, can I convince myself this is not going to do anything harmful to me? Uh, and if that happens, then I'm pretty willing to try things. And I try them like one or two at a time, not 10 at a time. So I'm also, our lab data in the mice on urolithin A is very positive. Um, and so I'm curious to see what happens with that as well. But I haven't tested that yet myself. And uh, rapamycin, uh, do you take it or uh, have uh, tried it? So I first would want to say that this is a product that has a drug that has side effects. And so I think the data on it suggests that you can take it in a way that dramatically minimizes the side effects and may, may cause efficacy. A lot of people are doing like once a week dosing with five or six milligrams of the drug. But um, so I will talk about that. I'm happy to talk about it, but I, I think we should say right ahead, right off, yeah, yeah. right up front that this is a drug and, you know, it, it really should be prescribed by a doctor. Uh, having said that, I I tried an a, a eight week interval of it. And, uh, but at the time I didn't do a lot of biologic aging testing. And so at some point I'm going to go back and do that. The, the problem is that I've become a, too much of an experimental organism. I've done too many different things to myself, so I'm not sure what the data you get in me is, how much value that has at this point, but I'm always curious. And, uh, you know, I, I I like doing it also because I, it, you learn things from it that you wouldn't otherwise think about. Uh, like when I first started trying AKG, I didn't use the sustain release version. I used just the, the normal product you can buy off the shelf. And um, it caused heartburn. Uh, it's because it's acidic, you know, it's not surprising when you think about it. Uh, when it's calcium AKG, though, in a sustained release format, it doesn't do that. So, and that, that's important when you're thinking about it, because if you're, you know, have an intervention you want people to take, if if they take it in the morning on an empty stomach, they cause us five minutes of heartburn, they're not going to keep taking it, right? So it's uh, uh, it's not detrimental, but it's uncomfortable. Uh, and so with rapamycin, one thing I noticed, and I don't know if this is, going to be true or not more broadly is that I do running and if I did running within 24 hours of taking the rapamycin I had really bad runs and and you know it may be that I just can't activate tor muscle to when needed to to deal with that um yeah I but if I waited a few days after taking it then I had really good runs and so it may be that restoring that mTOR balance is good for that but again you're asking me to speculate in n equals one so I make sure everybody knows that's the case yeah. So. Curious uh, question regarding uh, what dose uh, did you? Uh, I tried the five milligrams once a week. So. Yeah, yeah. And uh, how long did you uh, take it? I think I did eight weeks. Eight weeks. Um, yeah. 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 And uh, but you didn't uh, take blood tests and things like that. No, no, I didn't do that. And uh, why have you decided not to continue with uh, rapamycin? 
Well, you know, I, I've always thought that this might be something that's better on an intermittent basis than than all the time. I may be wrong. Maybe it's good all the time. But um, uh, that was my thinking. But then again, I started, then I got to testing other things. And again, I don't like mixing and matching. And so it's, uh, I haven't gotten back to rapamycin. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very interesting thing you point out there with the cycling periods of rapamycin. I think in one lecture or something like that, you mentioned that there was a mice study where the mice was given a low dose of rapamycin and that created a quite high mTOR inhibition, but after a while, that the mTOR inhibition was not that strong. Can you talk a little bit about the death study? Yeah, this was a long time ago. We were looking at rapamycin in mice, and we were giving it uh, IP, intraperitoneally, every other day. Um, and we we noticed that if, if you look the day after the first dose, you get this dramatic reduction in mTOR, and it's probably actually reducing activated mTOR, too, at that point. Um, because we were doing uh, star uh, fasting refeeding experiment. Um, but if you kept doing it every other day for a month and looked the day after that, the translation levels were equal to the where you before you started. And so that suggested that the animal compensates uh, for the effects on translation by inhibiting mTOR, which is not that surprising really when you think about the different kinds of ways you can regulate translation. Um, now, what we didn't do, and we should have done at that time, is we should have gone back and looked by riboseq or some method to see if there were differences in which RNAs were getting translated uh, a month later. I suspect there still were. I still think there's an effect of rapamycin. I just think you can't measure it in bulk translation. Uh, maybe uh, different kinds of messages are translated at different levels. And certainly, like 4-ABP data would suggest that regulating 4-ABP would have that effect. Um, but we didn't go back and revisit that experiment at the time to test that. We probably should go back and do that now. But um, yes, uh, the, the, the body does compensate in terms of bulk, tra bulk translation. Mm -hmm. And that could mean that cycling can be uh, beneficial. Yeah, it's possible. And certainly in mice, you just have to give like short windows of dosing to have big effects. So um, again, Mice are not human, so that we don't know if that'll translate, but it's possible. Yeah, it will be really interesting if you revisit that. Yeah. Are Are you offering funding? <laughs> <laughs> we can solve it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but if we go back to the rapamycin here, is that um, um, is is it something special that you think? can be good to keep an eye on when uh, taking your rapamycin? Yeah, I mean, obviously you don't want side effects. Uh, and the nice thing about mTOR inhibition is that the side effects are generally reversible in healthy people, at least. Um, and actually, again, from what people tell me, I didn't have this, uh, uh, mouth sores are one of the most common side effects you get from taking rapamycin. These are very uncomfortable, and you don't want them. But they don't—they go away if you stop taking it or cut back. And uh, you know, it's in a way, it's kind of a canary in the coal mine, right? It's, you know, but I think that's telling you that you're taking too much. And uh, so, you know, again, not a doctor, and not encouraging everyone to take it. But that's the—that's the, that's the uh, most common response I get from people that are taking it. I know uh, in your team, together with uh, Andrea Meyer, uh, you're going to start the rapamycin uh, trial uh, probably this year, uh, if everything goes right. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a matter of getting ethics approval. That's what that we're in the process of trying to get that right now. So I uh, can't do it without that, but I'm hopeful that we can find the right path to get that study started as soon as possible. What, what will uh, that uh, trial uh, look at? It's similarly designed as the AKG study. So um, we're looking at a wide range of parameters of aging. 
like, but also looking at inflammatory markers, particularly in that case, because rapamycin is known to reduce inflammation. So uh, we want to see that particularly. But, um, you know, we're doing base, we want to keep the interventions as similar as possible. So we're typically doing three to six month interventions, six is better, and then doing a follow up period to see if whatever changes happen during that time persist. Uh, and we're doing it in uh, reasonably healthy middle-aged people. Uh, one thing we realized from the AKG studies, which were not done by us, by the way, they were done by the company, PDL. But uh, what, as I mentioned, we found that people that were not aging particularly well responded better. So uh, we're using having a biologic age at or higher than your chronologic age as an inclusion criteria to try to see if we can enhance the outcome that we're seeing. Uh, and um, because with the power we're doing, which is a studies of about 120 to 200 people, uh, you know, we're, that's not a super high number of people to see small effects. So we, we want to try to see if we can enhance the effect size. Um, and, uh, you know, we people that don't have like any advanced chronic diseases or anything like that. Um, but, you know, with the, with the AKG, you know, we thought that those that was the best group to work in. But people that were quite old responded well, at least in the company-sponsored studies. So it, it may not be the case that we need to work in middle-aged populations. We might see older people respond better than we think based on that one study. So uh, I don't know if you are still uh, involved in uh, different companies who develop uh, wrapper logs. Yeah, I, I, we, we founded two companies at the Buck. One of them uh, kind of struggled. The other one I'm not involved with, but it's uh, Aovian, uh, which uh, is looking at um, der derivatives of rapamycin that we tested in our lab when I was at the Buck that have more specificity toward mTORC1 uh, based on the idea that the, a lot of the side effects of rapamycin come from mTORC2 inhibition and the benefits come from mTORC1. So if you can tip the balance more in the way of mTORC1, you might get good with less of the bad. Um, and I, I think they're looking at uh, tubular sclerosis, the TSC mutations that uh, the, the upstream of mTOR and that disease indication. So um, I still think there's a lot of value in finding derivatives of rapamycin that hit mTORC1. It's something that we're still interested in. What other ways is it uh, possible to inhibit uh, mTOR instead of, for example, rapamycin and uh, rapalog, uh, according to you? Well, I, I think that um, most of the longevity interventions, when we look at them, are having some effect on mTOR. Uh, it's reported for AKG already by other groups. Um, we haven't published this, but we see effects on mTOR from urolithin. Uh, we're also interested in gymfibrazil, uh, which is a, a drug that's classified as a fibrate. We don't think it really is, you know full disclosure, but it, it's uh, used for hypertriglyceridemia, uh, and it we think it's Im impacting amino acid uptake, and that's affecting mTOR signaling. So, you know, I think most of the longevity drugs can be read out as reduced mTOR signaling. The question is, is that the why they work, or is that just, is this everything so connected that you get everything? You, so I, I, that's still an open question, but everything we look at, or almost everything, somehow impacts mTOR. Uh, and I think that the, that's interesting to think about because you know, what's the best way to regulate mTOR uh, without the side effects? And I think the, I still put my money on rapamycin or some derivative ever elements or, but, uh, or even better mTORC1 specific inhibitors. But uh, a lot of these things impact mTOR. It's not just rapamycin. There is uh, quite a lot of uh, talk about uh, protein intake. There is one camp who is uh, advocating high protein intake and uh, another which is uh, advocating low protein intake. Uh, and uh, what your view on uh, this topic? Well, I'm not a nutritionist, but that's never stopped me before. So um, 
I, I I rely on that. I think the animal data is very clear on this. And uh, you know, if you keep animals a whole range of different species isocaloric, uh, and then you vary macronutrient concentration, um, it's high carb, low protein that's associated with long lifespan. Uh, so I guess I'm in the second camp. But there's a couple facets to that. One is that um, those are complex carbs, typically in animal diets, not simple sugars, depending on the animal. Um, second is that I said isocaloric, and I think one of the problems with carbohydrates is it's the fastest way to get to too many calories, particularly if you're eating simple sugars. Uh, and it does cause problems with insulin signaling if you're pouring in a bunch of sugar that's rapidly, you know, Already, it's basically glucose. So, so you know, when it gets in the body, it creates a whole bunch of problems. So, I think complex carbs, low protein, is probably healthier. I would also add that most of those animal studies are done in sedentary animals, uh, and I think we don't do enough studies where we actually combine exercise with nutrition to look at what's optimal. I suspect that if you're having more protein and you're doing a lot of anabolic exercise. Um, that it's probably okay for you, you know, but if you're not and you have a lot of free amino acids wandering around your bloodstream, that's a risk factor for a bunch of different things. So um, I think that it, it you have to balance you know, not just your what you're eating, but how active you are and what you're doing as well. Uh, and then, you know, on top of that, people have individual like susceptibility to different things, lactose intolerance, et cetera, and a bunch of other things. And so it's a very personalized answer, I think, diet. And that's one of the reasons it's hard for people is that you pick up a book and it says, everybody do this. And you know that that's probably wrong for anything. <laughs> so uh, uh, the other thing is that um, you know, the keto diets, I think people lose weight on it. You know, I, I'm not, and I probably, I would guess if you unbalance your macronutrients in any direction, you know, you probably you might lose weight. I don't know if that's true. It's just speculation. But uh, that doesn't mean it's healthy. You know, there are lots of things that cause weight loss that aren't particularly healthy. Uh, and I think in the long term, it wouldn't be my choice. And the one important thing that you pointed out there was the personalized uh, dose uh, protocols uh, because uh, it's not only the protein intake but uh, also longevity interventions uh, that uh, i think you yeah, have for sure on, uh, uh, can you can you talk a little bit about that because uh, i think that is a really interesting and uh, important topic to list even in animals these are expensive studies and so typically people test one dose of something it's, it's just a roll of the dice, right? Because, you know, it's, it's really hard to predict what dose is going to work. And on top of that, mice often tend to metabolize drugs faster than humans. And so you can't do a one-to-one -one correlation between mouse and humans. Um, it's a resource problem, fundamentally. You know, it, it's like, uh, and, and we're trying to test multiple doses of different compounds now, but every time we add a new dose, it reduces another intervention we can test. And so it, it's it's a challenge. But I, I think it's totally true that different doses are going to be optimal for different people, no matter what it is. It could be protein, it could be exercise, whatever. It could be a drug or a supplement, and uh, we're not putting enough effort into that right now. Uh, even in vitamins, you know, I, I'm a believer in vitamins from the data we have in the lab. But I think that if you look at these human studies, um, we don't. Most of them don't really measure the vitamin levels in the bloodstream of the people doing the intervention. You know, and they don't measure the pathways downstream. In some cases, they're not known, but where they're known, they're not being measured. So, you know, if if you have, first, we don't even agree on what the normal level is, but let's say it's here, you know, and people arrange from here to here at the beginning of the experiment, and then you give everybody the same dose, and then you go from here to here. Some people are still low. Some people are too high. And then you muddle all that data together and don't get an outcome. And so I, I, I think, I, I suspect that if we really 
the first thing a longevity clinic could do is say, let's optimize the vitamins and micronutrients that we know you need, you know? And uh, so this, see what, this measure where you are on the spectrum, uh, supplement the things that are too low, uh, come back in two months and remeasure that and try to get those things optimal and see what the effect of that is. I suspect it would be significant. Uh, but vitamin companies don't want to do that because these are relatively low cost products uh, and they can't have people sending their blood in every two months or going to the doctor to optimize creating a new product for each person. So it's a, it's a feature of what the market is, but I think we're not really benefiting in a way we could from a lot of these things. Yeah, super interesting thing there. I think it uh, probably also goes into the thing that you touched on regarding mTOR, that uh, lots of things uh, inhibit the mTOR. And if we could somehow get the measurement on uh, humans, what the mTOR level they have, then probably we can customize also uh, those interventions. So we're Andre and I have you know people in our labs have been trying to look at that in the blood uh, blood samples and a um, little bit challenging but I, I think we hopefully we get an assay that works well there. Oh, super interesting. Well, my plan is to uh, interview Andre in the future, so hopefully uh, something has come out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I hope so too. So. Yeah. yeah, great. Uh, if we look at some of the most uh, promising uh, longevity interventions. What would you say are the four most uh, promising uh, longevity interventions uh, for humans? Uh, well, uh, you know, it's excluding lifestyle for the moment. You know, I, I think the there's short-term promise and long-term promise. So short-term promise, if I had to pick two, you know, I, I think, I still think rapamycin is the gold standard at the moment. Um, uh, you know, we have good data on AKG, but we also now have good data on urolithin A. So I think those are some supplements that I'm excited about. Uh, long term, you know, I think the rejuvenation studies are fascinating um, and uh, there are challenges, uh, certainly. Uh, but the idea that you can rejuvenate adult stem cell populations in your body um, seems to me like it's likely to have a really big impact on aging and especially if it's going to be combined with other interventions to like you know keep the niche young and things like that so uh that to me is an exciting area of research in the field right now and, and I, I think we should pay more attention to gene therapy i'm not so sure i'm ready to do it to myself yet i know you can go offshore and do that but um I think there we we've done a lot of genetic screens in in animals, and we know a lot of genes we can modify to get lifespan extension in those contexts. And we know some of the trade-offs that might come from knocking those genes down. Uh, and to me, now that gene therapy is becoming much more effective, uh, we should put more attention into that. What are you doing yourself to stay healthy and uh, live uh, longer? Well, you know, I taking supplements, exercise, diet, sort of. <laughs> and uh, I also try to manage my stress. Uh, and uh, I think that's really important. You know, I went through a phase where, you know, I was feeling really stressed in life. And, uh, yeah, I wasn't really aware of it. You know, you don't think about it. Too many people don't even know whether they're stressed or not. And I think that self-awareness is really, really important. And there's still many things that could cause stress for me, uh, but I try to be aware of it and unpack it a little bit. <laughs> uh, and I think that that we don't tend to talk about that much in the, in the longevity field, but it's it's really, really important. And I also just, I have the attitude I'm going to live forever you know, I, I I don't want to sound like I, you know, Aubrey de Grey. I I, I like Aubrey. It's okay. <laughs> but it's, uh, uh, we actually agree on more than than we disagree on these days. Um, but uh, um, I think that attitude is very healthy. You know, it's like probably there's ninety nine percent chance I'm wrong, but I'll be dead anyway, so it's okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
I think you also have mentioned um, fasting and, and things uh, like that. Do you practice that uh, also? Yeah, so I, we did some of the early work in yeast and were involved a little bit in some of Walter Longo's studies in mice on fasting. And uh, I think it's uh, a much more feasible way to go about uh, reducing calories than calorie restriction is. I think that's harder for most people than eating. And if you eat in an eight hour window or 12 hour window, I think that's easier. Um, and the data looks quite promising from it. And, you know, Walter has a company producing fasting mimicking diets even that, that, that allow you to eat something, but still get the, some of the benefits of fasting. So I think that's a very promising area as well. I, I, it's hard for me to do that. I try to do that. I try to eat like one meal a day, but I'm, yeah, I end up having to go to lunch all the time and to dinner all the time. But, you know, it's I'm traveling when I don't have much jet lag in terms of sleep, but in terms of um, eating, I'm, it's very hard for me to fast at the right times when I'm traveling. So yeah. if we start rounding up a little bit here, um, one thing that uh, I think uh, is the interesting thing that you're doing is that uh, you're, you're trying to move the field forward in a faster way. And um, what can the uh, longevity community do to help up in speeding up this movement instead of just waiting for the results? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think that engagement is really important. So, and that can happen at multiple different levels. Uh, Certainly the private sector investment has been great for the field. I hope that continues. I'm trying to raise money for companies, so <laughs> as is everybody. Um, but we're also, the, the academic funding has not kept up at the same pace. Uh, and I think that that's a fundamental problem because there's basic science questions that we need to ask still. We still don't know, really, nobody can give a, really deep explanation about what causes aging, surprisingly. Um, I don't think we know whether maximum lifespan is easily modifiable in humans or not, important question. And we may have the interventions we develop for that may have to be on a totally different track than the ones we've selected so far. Um, and also, I just feel like that, you know, I'm gonna sound like a pedantic old aging researcher, but I, I feel like knowledge for knowledge sake has a lot of value. Uh, and uh, that's academic science has run away from those those kinds of issues, and that's going to be to everyone's detriment. I mean, every major discovery, almost everyone that I could think of, um, had some element of serendipity. Somebody was doing a project over here, and they made a discovery that was important for this. And you know, I, the fact understanding a process that happens to every person on earth and probably almost every animal seems like it's worth doing regardless of whether you know you, you want to live forever you don't want to live forever understanding why we age is just such a fundamental question to life on earth that we need to fund that and uh, some of that funding has to be in a non-profit driven way so i i think we need to still for emphasize academic research funding on aging and other areas of biology where can uh, people uh, find you online and uh, follow your work? Yeah, so you can uh, find me, uh, if you look up uh, NUS uh, Healthy Longevity on the slide and my name, you'll find uh, my lab, uh, our centers that we're running, and also our webinar, uh, which I don't want to compete with you here, but uh, we have a Healthy Longevity webinar uh, that... Uh, Thursdays at seven Singapore time. And we, all the shows are on YouTube after the fact, uh, and the hundredth show will be, uh, whatever the first Thursday in October is. So. <laughs> uh, I can really highly recommend the webinars. Uh, I haven't seen uh, quite many of those and, uh, you deliver lots of great uh, content there. And there are different uh, researchers who present uh, things, and, and you also have a, a little bit the interview session in the end. So really high quality uh, things you produce there. So big thumbs up for that.
Thanks a lot. And, you know, it, I just want to say that that's really meant for, to bring people together too. It's not all for scientists. We want clinicians, investors, just interested public regulators, whoever wants to watch, hopefully there's something in it for everybody. So Yeah, I will put that in the show notes so people can easily find it. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thanks. Great. I think uh, that's all. Um, it has been uh, really great to talk to you, Brian. And um, I really hope uh, everything goes uh, well uh, in Singapore and uh, you will uh, deliver uh, some great uh, results there. Well, if it works well, we'll do the show again in 75 years. Also. <laughs> yeah, that sounds really good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. Take care. All right. Talk to you soon. Thanks. Disclaimer, the podcast is for general information and uh, educational purposes only and is not medical advice for you or others. The use of information and other things linked to the podcast is at the user's own risk. Always consult your physician with anything you do regarding your health or medical conditions.